We're approaching the Thanksgiving season, so I'm going to do a Thanksgiving entry. Before we get started, you may have noticed the baby shoes that are up on the shelf. Here's the second one. The other one's still up on the shelf there. These were my shoes. And uh, when my mom passed on, I found them in her effects. And I put them up on the shelf to remind myself that I'm not this body. I can't be. You will see in the corner right there my past life portrait. I'll put it up on the screen. So if I was him, how could I be me? But if I'm me, how could I be him? And more importantly, how could I be the guy that fit into this shoe, see? So you can't possibly be your physical body. It's, it's obvious. We just don't want to go there, but it's pretty logically obvious. Now, uh, on the 6th, in the entry of the 6th, I did an entry about this book called Chanticleer, a Thanksgiving story of the Peabody family. And I uh, discussed why I believe it was not written by the person it's attributed to, which was Cornelius Matthews. And his name was not on the 1850 edition. It didn't appear until the 1856 edition. This, according to style and everything that I've studied about Matthew Franklin Whittier and his wife, Abby Poyan Whittier, it was theirs. And more specifically, it was hers. But I think that, first off, this was a period in which Matthew wrote, what is it, five books, uh, which are all mistakenly attributed to Asa Green. Asa Green had been Matthew's editor on the New York Constellation, editor-in-chief. Matthew was actually editing that paper. And when the cholera epidemic hit New York City in 1832, I th he stuck it out for quite a while, quite bravely as you can see in a couple of his uh, pieces. But at some point he left. I think Abby told him to get out. But at any rate, he left. And during the next couple of years, which is 1833, 1834, he wrote a series of five books, which uh, were mistakenly attributed by historians to Asa Green because they didn't know anything about Matthew. And they thought that Matthew had been writing for and editing that paper, The Constellation, and there's a clear correspondence between the books and the paper. What they didn't realize is that Matthew was editing the paper, that he wrote all that material that they ascribed to Asa Green, and that he also wrote the books. Well, anyway, that was the period, 32, 33, 34, when Matthew was writing those books, and apparently Abby decided to write one as well, and Matthew collaborated with her. Now, you know that A Christmas Carol was a collaboration between Matthew and Abby, in my estimation, and this was also a, a collaboration. Well, what I'm going to do is read the sermon. Now, there are sermons in A Christmas Carol. They come in where the ghosts speak, the spirits speak, and that was written by Abby. She's the one that wrote the quote-unquote sermons. William Makepeace Thackeray extolled those sermons as the, as the best in the world or something like that. I'll put it up on the screen. I meant to print it out and read it, but I'll just put it up on the screen and underline the sections I'm talking about. You can see that he praised those sermons thinking they were written by Charles Dickens. Those were written by Abby. The one in here that I'm going to read was written by Abby, but the second half, Matthew tacked on his own sermon. Now, I can prove by style that this was written during this early period, we're talking 1833 probably, because of Matthew's attitude toward eating meat. It's, it's definitely demonstrated in the part of the sermon that Matthew tacked on at the end, which we're going to read. And I'll show you where it comes in even earlier. I didn't get my glasses, so I'm going to do that. In the June 9, 1835, New York Transcript. Now, the New York Transcript was Asa Green's third newspaper. And uh, Matthew went back, and I don't know if he edited for this one because he was very busy with his mercantile career, but he may have edited it sometimes, and he wrote for it. And here we have a couple poems. Now, the first one is signed Trismegistus. I can prove that Trismegistus was Matthew's signature. He had used it. Early on in his career, uh, maybe, what, seven years earlier in 1828 in the New England Galaxy, which was the paper he first started publishing in in Boston. Um, he'd used it, I think, four times in that paper. Here he used it a couple times in the New York Transcript. And on June 29, 1835, we have a poem signed Trismegistus. 
This one, however, is reprinted from the New Haven Herald, New Haven, Connecticut. And I think what used to happen was that when Matthew was living in New York City, editing or writing for these newspapers that were owned by Asa Green, he either would sign them with, you know, one of his pseudonyms for those papers, or he would not sign them at all. But when he went out of town, when he went home, see, he would, um, he would submit to other papers, and then he would reprint them when he got back to New York City in his own paper. So I think that's what's happened here. I think he was out of town. Uh, June 2nd was Abby's birthday. He may have written it for Abby for her birthday. And he thought he was being cute. And you can you can back engineer these things, reverse engineer these things and extrapolate what the situation was. This is called a small specimen of the fashionably simple style for the lovers of nature. Now, Abby was a nature mystic. She loved animals. She loved birds. And I extrapolate from this that she was probably a vegetarian. You'll see that in A Christmas Carol, where the spirit of Christmas present is introduced, and he's a big bare-chested giant surrounded by meat dishes. That was obviously Charles Dickens' insertion. He uh, took out, edited out whatever Abby had for the second spirit, which was probably too similar to the first one, and he added in his fantastical giant with all of these meat dishes around him. But then, as in the next scene, as soon as they get to a market, in the next scene, there's no meat anywhere. It's all vegetables and fruits for sale, see? So that was written by Abby. This part that's all meat dishes was written by Charles Dickens. It's very obvious when you know what you're looking at. So Abby was probably a vegetarian, and Matthew was not, and he was teasing her. Now, he was pretty rough when he teased her. She would try to teach him about prescient dreams, which she had, and he would ridicule that logically. See, he was a skeptic. This, we're talking... Well, that was like 1830, something like that. So still, he's a skeptic about, about vegetarianism. And I'm going to read it. Yay, geese are good. See, he's an answer. This is, this is an answer to an argument they had or, or a discussion they had. Yay, geese are good. A charm is theirs, which ducks, though fat and plump, have not, though nourished by the summer airs and fatted in a swampy spot. And turkey, too. Oh, who would say the turkey is not very good? For search the land and search the sea, you cannot meet with better food. And beef, a well-cooked piece of beef. Oh, might I live existence or... You can see she had taught him about reincarnation, I think, and he had ridiculed that also. Oh, might I live existence or, and write again life's checkered leaf. Beef would I ask, and ask no more. And stewed, or fried, or roast, or raw, in busy life, or lonely cloister, nor saint or sinner ever saw a sweeter morsel than an oyster, Trismegistus. So Matthew thought he was being cute, see? And I think she broke up with him. And the reason is not because she was mad at being teased, but because Abby was very concerned. First off, she was courting to marry. You know, she had in mind marrying Matthew. And she could not marry someone who was callous or worldly, see? And this convinced her briefly that Matthew was not marriage material for her. That he was too worldly and too crass and too insensitive and uncaring. So she must have broken up with him or threatened to. And now, immediately under this, is an unsigned poem. And this is also Matthew, I know by style, and he's freaking out because she took it way more seriously than he intended. And he says, now this, this is typical, you'll see this in The Raven, that he's very serious He's suffering, and yet he tries to make a joke out of it. That's the weird combination of humor and grief that you see in The Raven. That was Matthews. It was not Edgar Allan Poe. Well, here you see exactly the same thing. He, it's a humorous poem, sort of, but he's dying inside. He says, Oh, do not turn thy face away, sweet lady dear, from me. Soon, soon, alas, must end my day if I, thy fizz, don't see. Now, in the previous entry, I showed you how many times Matthew used the word fizz. I forget what it is now, but it's quite a few. In thy soft beams I live alive, from them I draw my light, and whilst they brightly on me shone, as scoured tin all was bright, 
But now a dismal cloud appears to darken o'er my sky. My bosom heaves with restless fears. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Well, he's joking, but he's quite serious. So that just gives you an idea of the difference between Abby and Matthew at this early stage. Now I want to show you something that gives us an idea of what Abby thought about religion. This is a little later. This is the December 1st, 1838 edition of the Christian Register and Boston Observer. It's one of two poems that Abby sought fit to sign with her full maiden initials, A-R-P for Abby Rochemont Poyen. Rochemont was a name she adopted. It wasn't what she was born with as a middle name. And um, the other one has to do with slavery. So I know that these are hers. I think she signed it ARP to distinguish herself from Albert Pike because Albert Pike had claimed all of her early poetry that was signed AP since they had the same initials. So here in 1838, she's going to make sure that he can't claim those. And she writes, Religion, from hollowed shrines let fragrant incense rise in wreathing volumes to the azure skies and speak the grateful homage of the soul when man would own his maker's high control. But costly spices on the marble mound, or perfume scattered on the humbler ground, or prostrate heads, or bended knees alone, find no acceptance at the heavenly throne. Tis the pure heart, devoted and sincere, bowing in grateful love and holy fear, the upturned eye and the imploring gaze the heartfelt prayer and joyous songs of praise. Tis the firm faith and actions free from guile, the mind exempt from thoughts which may defile, the strict obedience to our maker's laws that prove the votary of religion's cause, A-R-P. So now you see how Abby took religion, and you will see it again in the first sermon in Chanticleer. So we will start that. Here is Chanticleer, a Thanksgiving story of the Peabody family. And we open when the patriarch, who's 100 years old, the patriarch of the family, Sylvester, makes his comments before the whole clan, the whole Peabody clan, see? She begins, Will you pardon me, reader, if I fail to tell you whether this house of worship was of the Methodist, Episcopal, or Baptist creed, whether it had a chancel or altar or painted windows, whether the pews had doors to them and were cushioned or not, whether the minister wore a gown and bands or plain suit of black or was undistinguished in his dress. Will it not suffice if I tell you, as the very belief of my soul, that it was a Christian house, that there were seats for all, that things were well intended and decently ordered, and that with a hymn sung with such purity of heart that its praises naturally joined in with the chiming of the trees and the carols of the birds without and floated on without a stop to heaven when a meek man rose up. Now you notice there's things embedded in this. She's a universalist. She believes that everyone will be saved. And you see it in a Christmas carol when Tiny Tim chimes in, God bless us, everyone. That's no mistake. That's not just a casual thing thrown in. And you see that she's a na nature mystic because she talks about the carols of the birds without, see? So um, these are little signs that Abby is more of a mystic than just a traditional uh, fundamentalist type Christian. So here's the meek man rose up, and this would be Sylvester the patriarch. Some 200 years ago, our ancestors, he said, finding themselves more comfortable in the wilderness of the new world than they could have reasonably looked for, set apart a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God for his manifold mercies. That day, God be praised, has been steadily observed throughout this happy land by cheerful gatherings of families and other festive and devotional observances down to the present time. Our fathers covenanted in the love of Christ to cleave together as brethren, however hard the brunt of fortune might be. That bond still continues. We may not live, he went on, in the very spirit and letter of the first Thanksgiving discourse ever delivered amongst us, as retired hermits, each in our cell apart, nor inquire, like David, 
How liveth such a man? How is he clad? How is he fed? He is my brother. We are in league together. We must stand and fall by one another. Is his labor harder than mine? Surely I will ease him. Hath he no bed to lie on? I have two. I will lend him one. Hath he no apparel? I have two suits. I will give him one of them. Eats he coarse food, bread and water, and have I better? Surely we will part stakes. He is as good a man as I, and we are bound each to other, so that his wants must be my wants, his sorrows my sorrows, his sickness my sickness, and his welfare my welfare. For I am as he, such a sweet sympathy were excellent, comfortable, nay heavenly, and is the only maker and conserver of churches and commonwealths. To such as looked upon old Sylvester, there seemed a glow and halo about his aged brow and whitened locks, for this was the very spirit of his life. As though he knew the very secrets of their souls. Now, Abby is also a psychologist and, uh, you know, precursor to psychology. She has a deep grasp of it. And you see that in A Christmas Carol where Scrooge is taken back to his childhood, that psychoanalysis, and she's going to show us the same psychological insight here. As though he knew the very secrets of their souls and touched their very heartstrings with a gentle hand, the preacher glanced from one member of the Peabody household to another as he proceeded something in this manner. And parentheses for William Peabody, he's going through each of the members. Do I find on this holy day that I love God in all his glorious universe more than the image even of liberty, which hath ensnared and enslaved the soul of many a man on the coin of this world? For buxom Mrs. Jane in her Van Dyke, do I stifle the vanity of good looks and comfortable circumstances under a plain garb for the jovial captain? Am I not over hasty in pursuit of carnal enjoyment for Mr. Oliver? who was wiping his brow with a Declaration of Independence. He has a print of the Declaration of Independence on his handkerchief. And eager over much for the good opinion of men, when I should be quietly serving them without report, for Mrs. Carrick and her son. And what are pomp and fashion but the painted signs of good living where there is no life? These, he continued, are all outward, mere pretenses to put off our duty and the care of our souls. Yes, we may have churches, schools, hospitals abounding, but these are mere lath and mortar. If we have not also within our own hearts a church where the pure worship ever goeth on, a school where the true knowledge is taught, a hospital, the door whereof standeth constantly open, into which our fellow creatures are welcomed, and where their infirmities are first cared for with all kindness and tenderness, now look at that. She's a, she's a mystic. So she says, there is an inner hospital. You know, there's an inner church. And if you don't have that, what good is the outward one? So this is typical of mysticism is that as above, so below, which means as inside, so outside. If these be our inclinings this day, let us be reasonably thankful on this Thanksgiving morning. Let such as are in health be thankful for their good case and such as are out of health be thankful that they are no worse. Let such as are rich be thankful for their wealth, if it hath been honestly come by, and let such as are poor be thankful that they have no charge upon their souls. Let old folks be thankful for their wisdom in knowing that young folks are fools, and let young ones be thankful that they may live to see the time when they may use the same privilege. Let lean folks be thankful for their spare ribs, which are not a burthen in the harvest field. Fat folks may laugh at lean ones and grow fatter every day. Let married folks be thankful for blessings both little and great. Let bachelors and old maids be thankful for the privilege of kissing other folks' babies, and great good may it do them. With what a glow of mutual friendship the quaint preacher was warming the plain old meeting house on that Thanksgiving day. That's Abby Poyan, the future Abby Poyan Whittier. And you see, it is a little bit preachy, you know, and you'll see that in the Christmas Carol also. That was her. Now, suddenly, we get to Matthew. He is inserting his own sermon. I'm going to take a quick sip of water here. 
Finally, and to conclude, see, this wasn't the original conclusion. Finally, and to conclude, parentheses, he went on in the language of a chronicle of the time. Let no man look upon a turkey today and say, this also is vanity. What is the life of man without creature comforts and the stomach of the son of man with no aid from the tin kitchen? Despise not the day of small things while there are pullets on the spit and let every fowl have fair play between the jaws of thy philosophy. Are not puddings made to be sliced and pie crust to be broken? Go thy ways then, according to good sense, good cheer, good appetite, the governor's proclamation, and every other good thing under the sun. Render thanks for all the good things of this life, and good cookery among the rest. Eat, drink, and be merry. Make not a lean laudation of the bounties of providence, but let a lively gusto follow a long grace. Feast thankfully, and feast hopingly. Feast in good will to all mankind, Grahamites included. Those were like people following somebody named Graham who had a very sparse diet, health, health food diet. Feast in the full and joyous persuasion that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, dinner time, pudding time, and supper time are not likely to go out of fashion. Feast with exulting confidence in the continuance of cooks, kitchens, and orthodox expounders of scripture and the constitution in our ancient, blessed, and fat-sided commonwealth. Feast, in short, like a good Christian, proving all things, relishing all things. He's paraphrasing St. Paul, which he, who he defended in that lifetime. I don't. Hoping all things, expecting all things, and enjoying all things. Let a good stomach for dinner go hand in hand with a good mind for sound doctrine. Let us all be thankful that a gracious providence hath furnished each and all with a wholesome and bountiful dinner this day. And if there be none so furnished, let him now make it known, and we will instantly contribute thereto of our separate abundance. There are none who murmur. We all, therefore, have a Thanksgiving dinner waiting for us. Let us hie home cheerfully, and in a becoming spirit of mirth and devotion, partake thereof. So what Matthew has done is basically jump in and ruin the spirituality of Abby's sermon. This is what he did early on. It's amazing she suffered him, you know, uh, but she could see in him the seeds of spirituality and greatness in spirituality. See? So she gradually brought him up. You know, she was four years younger, but she was his tutor in spirituality as well as in worldly matters. And she gradually brought him along. So you can see, though, that this is clearly not written by just one person. It could not possibly have been written entirely by Cornelius Matthews. In fact, it wasn't written by him at all. He tacked his name onto it for some reason in 1856. It was anonymous in 1850. It was published by Matthew posthumously nine years after Abby died at, during the same period that he was publishing her short stories posthumously in the Boston Weekly Museum, about 10 or 12 of them, something like that. So I'm quite certain that that's what this is. And uh, you can certainly get a sense of Matthew's satirical sense of humor and that he was kind of irreverent. He did believe in helping other people. He wasn't an atheist, but he was certainly uh, skeptical about things like vegetarianism. And uh, eventually, by 1857, he was advocating vegetarianism, which is rather interesting. But he came around slowly, and, and a lot of that process happened after Abby had passed on. So, uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I will be having a very simple one here, as I have no friends in Portland. And, uh, you know, I'm a vegetarian, and I just, because nobody buys my books or pays me to speak anywhere, I live very, very, very cheaply. And uh, so I will probably be eating my usual rice and, you know, squash or something. But uh, I hope you have better fare than I will be having. And uh, we will come back when it's closer to Christmas, and I will explain at length just how Charles Dickens falsely ended up with credit for A Christmas Carol, how he popularized it but did not write it and uh, we'll go into that a little bit later I'll also at some point read I think in its entirety the little short story that was the template 
that Matthew and Abby obviously used when they started writing A Christmas Carol sometime in late 1838, wrapping it up in 1839.